Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Hi, this is Sarah Trott. Welcome back to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm here with a guest, Deb Flaschenberg, who I will introduce in a moment. And before I do, I'd like to remind our listeners that we have a website, which is www.fourthtrimesterpodcast.com. And if you have not signed up for our newsletter, please go to our website on your phone or on the computer and sign up for our newsletter because we send detailed information and show notes and you can listen through the web. Also, I want to remind you that uh, we have a Facebook community, an Instagram community, so you can go ahead and follow and sign up with us there. And please do like us on Facebook. We would appreciate that. So thank you so much. Esther Gallagher is not on our show with us today, sadly. She is traveling in a way, so we will miss her, but she'll be back with us again very soon. So let's talk about Deb for a moment and talk about why she's on our show. A little bit about Deb. So she graduated from the Boston Conservatory of Music, and she was introduced to yoga through a choreographer in 1997. And after that, she became a Bikram yoga instructor and then later studied the maternal fitness method. And after witnessing several typical hospital births, typical in quotation marks, um, Deb felt it was important to move beyond the yoga room and be present in the birthing room. So in 2003, she attended her first birth as a DONA certified labor support doula. And since then, she's attended hundreds of births. And Deb is also a Lamaze certified childbirth educator, and she completed a midwife assistant program with Ina May Gaskin, Pamela Hunt, and many of the other farm midwives at the Farm Midwifery Center in Tennessee. Also, amazingly, Deb has her own podcast called Yoga, Birth, and Babies, which we'll link to on our article about this episode on our website so you can go and click through and subscribe to her podcast as well. Today, Deb draws on her own experience as a prenatal yoga instructor a labor support doula, a childbirth educator, and mother herself. Deb supports pregnant women with functional yoga and helping them create a functional birth and ease into parenting so that they feel empowered and honored as they are on their sacred journey of birth and beyond. So thank you so much for being with us today, Deb. Thank you so much for having me. I understand you had a unique experience with your first baby from your second baby and your own fourth trimester. Um, Would you be willing to share that story with us? Oh, absolutely. So the births were completely different from one another. And my first birth, it was was a bit challenging. It was um, about 42 hours. And that's like a whole work week. And it was really mentally and physically draining, straining. I pushed what felt like forever. Uh, surprised to actually end up with a vaginal birth. And because of such a long birth experience and such a long second stage of pushing, my body was pretty trashed after. And my pelvic floor just was a mess. And it was really, that was where a lot of my focus was in that fourth trimester is like, what happened to my body? How do I feel worse postpartum than I did prenatally? And a lot of that had to do because I was over-exercising during pregnancy. And so it was really anxiety provoked time. I really loved being a mother and I really felt very close with my husband and my baby. But from a physical level, I was seeing a PT. I was just trying to understand what happened to me. And so a lot of it was working with the PT and doing physical therapy at home. And so that's where a lot of my time and energy was spent. And then because it was such a hard first birth, I was a bit terrified entering my second, thinking I can't go through that again. So I approached it really differently. The whole way I worked out, my yoga, everything was different. So I wouldn't have such a challenging 
postpartum. So because I approached it so differently and I did body work, I did, I worked with a chiropractor. My second labor was so different. I think from start to finish was maybe four hours. I pushed for six minutes as opposed to five hours, <laughs> I know, which is also the joy of a second baby. Most statistically second births are quicker, but I mean, <laughs> this is pretty dramatic. So it was easier on the healing side on that for that fourth trimester. I wasn't so preoccupied with where's the integrity of my pelvic floor? What's going on? You know, seeing different doctors and different PTs, it really was, I could cherish it more. I could actually wear my baby because my first one, because my pelvic floor was so compromised, I couldn't even wear him. And so being able to strap her into a carrier and leave was just amazing. I just loved the snuggling in and kissing her little head, which I, I couldn't do with my first. So they were, they were so different. But also being a second time mom, I think takes the, some of the anxiety and and makes it a little easier. Mm-hmm. And everyone's experience is different. So listeners, you know, I, I I have to put it out there, you know, just because someone had some experience, it doesn't mean it's going to be like that for you. Yes. One of the things that's so interesting about your story is yes, they were so different. And also it seems like you had just to highlight one of the major differences. It sounds like it was that your expectations changed. The expectations did change. Um, for the whole situation, from the pregnancy to the birth to the postpartum, things were different. I mean, there were some lovely, wonderful things of that first trim, that that fourth trimester with my first child. Um, but I definitely think some of the, things just felt a little easier. I also had different help at that point because I do work full time. I, I had a nanny, and it did help having extra hands right away in the household. So it, it was a li- it was a little easier, which I appreciated. And here you are, someone whose professional career is physical, the body, exercise, things along those lines. And And I did it all wrong. And that (laughs) – well – and this is where you're you're kind of highlighting was a a struggle for you. Yeah. um, It does kind of amaze me how wrong I did it and as well as that nobody – stopped me. Um, and it because it was such a hard birth, I feel like I learned so much and it changed the way I teach. So because I was doing way too much exercise, I was still keeping up with a lot of my advanced yoga. I was still going to spin class like five days a week and doing weightlifting. I was just so tight and my pelvis was just not, my psoas was so tight, my pelvis wasn't well aligned. That create problems with fetal position. And when babies are not optimally positioned, it makes labor harder. And I think it's about 70% of Oxford posterior babies end up with a C-section. So because I just did way too much and I was just so hypertonic in my pelvic floor and pelvis, it made the birth so much harder. So I did things very differently my second time, but it also changed how I how I now teach. My focus is now looking at the pregnant body and making sure that everything's really well aligned, that we're not overly tightening, we're creating balance in the psoas and the pelvic floor and the pelvic ligaments so that the mom can have what I call a functional birth without it being baby malpositioned. So it really, it massively changed. Mm -hmm. What was that you said? Something was so tight or so? Oh, my psoas, uh, the psoas muscle. It's a muscle that runs from the 12th thoracic down the lumbar and kind of behind the uterus and connects into the upper head of the femur. Um, People call it the hip flexor. Um, and you have two of them and they basically cradle the uterus. And if they're too tight, it can create what's called injury and constraint when the uterus isn't well balanced and, and kind of circular. And if the baby, if the uterus is torqued, the baby doesn't have the optimal space to negotiate through the pelvis, kind of corkscrew out. And a lot of exercise, um, things that are more one-sided uh, or sp- a lot of spin classes do that. And it creates too much tightness. And I hear a lot of women then tell me what a hard birth they had, but throughout their whole pregnancy, they never really modified their activity. They didn't, you know, they have to take in consideration that we, the body's different and we're growing a person and that has different criteria of what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. So let's translate your personal experience and what you're doing now with women into kind of an overview of what you'd recommend for a different way. <laughs> uh, I would say at some point, get off the, the spin bike. Um, I remember my spin teacher telling me, she's like, for some reason, all my students end up with a C-section. And I'm like, oh, that won't be me, which it totally should have been. Um, I, so I would say 
really be mindful of the exercise one's participating in. You know, is it creating a sense of balance or is it keeping up with that notion of I have to keep moving and moving and moving and moving and only look in a certain way? So I work now really mindfully if there's any sort of pelvic issue, if there's um, sacroiliac problems, if there's lower back pain, if there's tightness. So I try to reorganize the way I teach asana to create a sense of balance in the pelvis and pelvic floor. I think it's kind of a misconception that everyone thinks, oh, I'm pregnant, I better kegel it up. And that can actually create too much tightness. So I really changed my whole approach. That's so confusing, isn't it? To say, okay, (laughs) Do kegels, but not too many, right? Well, it's like- more about – I think with, with kegels is everyone just kind of squeezes whatever they can find. And it, that's not really the intention. Pelvic floor work should be the ability to learn how to stretch the pelvic floor as well as tone if it's needed. A lot of people don't need to tone. They're hypertonic. My teacher, uh, Leslie Howard, says about 40% of women are hypertonic. And then they're told, all right, just you know, do your kegels. And then they're making their problem worse. Hypertonic. Too tight. Okay. <laughs> so there's this happy medium that it sounds like is a is a balance of um, being mindful of the body, being healthy. I mean, so for our women who are listening and preparing for a birth, what's a good guideline? Like where do they start? So it feels in general, it seems obvious, like, okay, don't overdo it. But I think you have to look at, I think they have to be really mindful and look at where they are. And say, you know, what is my normal activity? Is it helping me? Is it hindering me? Is it creating energy in my body or is it draining me? And for some people, maybe they never did exercise before. So they don't want to just dive into something really strong. And for other people, they may be, you know, a six, seven day a week exerciser and they may need to slow it down. So I think someone has to look at what they're doing, also why they're doing it. I think from a personal experience, I think I was striving for a certain kind of pregnant look. And I hate to say that, but I think it was a little type A. And I think I was getting overly involved with the external look. And I'm in social media does not help that. Mm-hmm. You know, that I will admit, like all that really changed on me was my belly and my boobs. I looked pretty much the same, which is probably not ideal. So I think... We have to look at why, what we're, what's pushing us to exercise so hard if that's what someone's doing. So I think kind of a guideline would be, you know, examining what you're doing, why you're doing it, how intense you're doing it, and is it creating imbalance? Are you only strengthening? Are you adding stretch? Are you adding mindful breathing? Are you creating movements that are going to support the pregnant body? Or are you just trying to plow away with what you did and you're actually ignoring pains that you might be getting while pregnant? Mm. Yeah. So ignoring pain sounds like a an obvious red flag. Yeah. But for some, um, I mean, I grew up in the dance world that pain was just kind of part of it. So, you know, I'm like choreographer didn't care if we were in pain. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, certain mindsets, pain is part of their their workout. And we have to look that pain's usually a sign that something's wrong, and especially during pregnancy. Okay. So let's dispel the myth. The myth <laughs> is... <laughs> Uh, one should just power through pain or not um, yeah. their same routine and their same regimen that they had before because they need to stay strong. Yeah, let, let's not do that. And let's yeah, examine no. what is helping the pregnant body. Because from my own experience, I was so hard set on keeping up with exercise and keeping a certain image, it prolonged my healing process. It made my fourth trimester more about repairing my body than fully absorbing in the juiciness of new motherhood. So is yoga one of the activities that someone could do to help stretch and open? Because I know like we've we've talked to a number of like somatic um, people on on the program who kind of really talk about like this notion of like opening up your your body and your um, um, and your mind. Um, I think depending on how it's approached. So Throughout my journey of yoga, as you mentioned in my bio, um, gosh, it was almost 18 years ago, I started with Bikram yoga and soon became very disenchanted with it because that yoga really doesn't allow for being individualized. And I started to study vinyasa and Iyengar, which is different. And then from that, I looked at 
creating the, again, going back to creating balance. So if someone uses their yoga to create openness, to create balance, to create flexibility and strength, then absolutely it can well prepare the body. It can try to alleviate sacroiliac pain. It can alleviate a lot of the carpal tunnel that can happen. It can create I call it a springy pelvic floor, a lot of bounce. But if someone's sticking really hard to more advanced practice, which is a lot of engagement of the pelvic floor, uh, often some problems in the SI joint, it cannot actually help. I've seen a lot of yoginis have very hard births because their bodies were so tight. So I think yoga is a fantastic tool and vehicle if approached in a way that's going to create balance. Mm Mm-hmm. And so what did you do when you prepared for your second birth that was obviously a different experience? I I did not spin. Um, (laughs) I did not spin at all. Um, I really created a practice that softened the psoas, that balanced the pelvis. I, You know, one thing that was really different is I saw a chiropractor starting at week 36, and she kept working on the Webster technique to make sure everything was well aligned and baby was well aligned. And that's something I recommend a lot to second time pregnant students if they had a harder first birth. If they're coming back and they kind of had a similar story to me that baby was malpositioned and it was really physically and emotionally stressful, that when they approach it, I find the the Webster technique to be really helpful. And I think it puts someone at ease saying, I'm doing everything I can. So I, my whole exercise routine was different. And I just, I mean, granted, I had a two and a half year old when I was fully pregnant. So um, just my exercise in general, my, my time <laughs> was different. But yeah, I gave myself the permission to not stress as much about what I looked like. And just to, you know, certain days, my exercise was taking a walk as opposed to, all right, I have to get to the gym. So I, again, I kind of, I was just kinder to myself. And then what, what were you talking about with malposition? The ideal position for a baby in the pelvis is when their chin is tucked into the chest and the smallest part of their head is pressing against the cervix and their spine is pointing forward, ideally to the left side of mom. And if we think about the way a head fits to the cervix, it's kind of the same idea as putting a turtleneck sweater on. So you wouldn't stick your face up into the turtleneck and pull pull it over your head. You'd kind of tuck your chin and pull the turtleneck over your head because the smallest part of your head is the back of the head. So it's pretty much the same as the way that the head needs to put pressure against the cervix to emerge through. So during surgeries or contractions, the uterus contracts and it gets uh, thicker at the top and pushes down. So it actually kind of retracts to the top and pushes down. So the uterus is pushing the baby's head against the cervix. And if it's well positioned, well aligned, chin to chest, smallest part pushing against the cervix, the cervix is going to open easier. If the head is asynclitic, meaning the ear is closer to a shoulder, you now have kind of the side of the head trying to push the cervix open. Or if the baby's posterior with the spine against mom's back, the baby's trying to push the cervix open with its forehead, which doesn't mold. So a well positioned baby is going to have a more, a small smoother, more functional birth. And that's something that changed the whole way I taught is that it really occurred to me that we have to work on baby's position and what the pregnant mother's doing to help assist the position. Because I hear a lot of births, I've been as a doula, to a lot of births that were long and usually it's baby position that's causing that elongated labor. And what is Webster and how does that impact these topics? Okay, I don't know exactly how to describe Webster. I'll give it kind of what I experienced. Um, they make sure that the the chiropractor makes sure that the pelvis is aligned, the three main bones, the two innominate bones in the sacrum. And they're also trying to balance the, the psoas. I mentioned those are the muscles that run behind the uterus. And I remember my chiropractor simply had me raise my arms over my head and had my hands touch. And she's like, oh, your right psoas is tighter because she could see that right arm was slightly lower. So it's a chiropractic adjustment that can help create balance in the pelvis and the psoas to help the baby find its optimal position so that it can descend through the pelvis and have an easier birthing experience. Got it. That makes sense. Do you think that would be useful for a first birth as well? Absolutely. In fact, I tell all my students, if you want to take that little extra push just to make yourself feel like you've covered all your bases, you know, I don't think it can hurt. And it often makes people feel like they really set themselves up for success. And it may not work, but, you know, it's not going to hurt. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's true for, for a lot of the things that people, um, do in the whole world of preparation. Um, so let's, let's shift gears a little bit. So talk to me about, um, preparing for life with the newborn. Well, I think a lot of it goes back to preparing for the birth. So if the birth is well supported, if the if she's really tried to get her body aligned, she has the birth team around her that's well supporting her, the transition into postpartum can be, I think, easier. And some of the statistics I came up with, it's a little bit staggering about how women feel after birth. If, if someone's traumatized from their birth, their birth experience, I think motherhood's going to be harder because they're not fully present for the motherhood. They're trying to heal from that experience. And some of the stats I came up with was 9% of women met full criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder following their births. And an additional 18% had, a post-traumatic, had post-traumatic symptoms. So think about if you ha- if you're having that trauma, how are you going to be available for baby. So I think really setting yourself up for the success of the support you need for your birth, of healing, of feeling heard and seen and supported is going to ease the transition into motherhood. And then I also think there's just some practical things like taking classes, knowing what the reality of a newborn is, as opposed to kind of, again, the social media or what movies portray. I remember my mom telling me she was so surprised by postpartum. Like she just thought she'd be pushing a baby in the stroller with like birds around her and like a soundtrack around her, you know? I think sometimes we have a Disney version. (laughs) (laughs) And that's not really realistic. So I think it's a lot of things. I think it's really getting a sense of reality about what to expect. I think it's being prepared for your birth. And then there's a lot of practical stuff, taking the classes, making sure, you know, newborn classes, if you're choosing to breastfeed, taking breastfeeding classes, um, making sure that you have support set up for yourself. So I think we can start to go into some practical things if you want. Yes, let's do that. Okay, so the practical. Um, Let's start with just making sure you've, you've set yourself up for support. So what is that going to look like? You've had your baby, your home, and then what, <laughs> and then what mm-hmm. happens? You know, do you have family there? Can you say yes or no to your family? Because some family may not be welcome all the time. Um, some family may actually expect you to wait on them. Um, I kind of have that experience. (laughs) They're like, what, you're not going to get me some coffee? Um, You know, so set yourself up. Is it a postpartum doula? Is it a baby nurse? What is, what is, uh, the time after are you taking how much time are you taking off of work have you set up if you're getting paid for that are you not getting paid is your partner there what kind of friends are coming over what are they bringing because i don't think we really need flowers i think food instead you know so really thinking about the support you need i personally love a postpartum doula um we used one for both my kids and i thought it was amazing to have someone in there caring for mom as well as baby, which is different than a baby nurse. And it was also different than having a parent or an in-law because they were really there to 100% serve. They were there to serve me and my husband and, and the baby. And they taught me things. You know, Even though I did take the courses, I remember my uh, postpartum doula teaching me really how to swaddle with a live baby as opposed to a doll and how to bathe the baby. And and she did things like our laundry and did some shopping. So I think really setting up the help and support is probably the top thing you can do to help that somewhat tumultuous time of trying to figure out how to parent. Hey, fellow parents. Can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family. And your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. 
Um, I also think it's important to know when to say no to visitors because a lot of friends, they mean well, they love you, they want to see your your new family. And it could feel straining at times to have to entertain people. Um, Maybe you want to sleep. Maybe you're just trying to get breastfeeding situated if you choose to do that and your boobs are hanging out and you may not want to have visitors. Um, I do think a food train is nice if you can set your friends up to come. Um, Maybe they're ordering food for you. Maybe they're bringing food. I also think preparing food a lot of times ahead of time is is great if you have the freezer space. Um, And then there's also kind of the physical. Do you want me to go into that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. You've just went through the most amazing list, which I think... I hope that wasn't too fast. N- no, no, no. I just, I, I want everyone who's listening to stop, rewind, <laughs> get out their notebook, and then write that down and make that your playbook. Because Good. so much of that practical stuff, it seems it seems like it might not be a big deal. But when you're in a place where you're physically exhausted, you have this little person to, that's taking up all of your focus and your energy... You just don't have time to be making yourself food. You don't have time to be like thinking about, well, what would my ideal social um, calendar look like (laughs) now that I have a newborn? Um, So like doing all of that stuff ahead of having your baby can go such a long way. So go back, listen, write that list down. Yeah, and the time (laughs) off too. I've actually had people realize that they didn't really arrange for the time off, that they knew they were pregnant, but they didn't know how long they were going to take off. Um, And then a lot of places, I know there's the Family Care Act, which you get 12 weeks unpaid, but some states you get paid leave. Uh, And so making sure, you know, the employee meets that criteria is really setting that up so that you're not thinking of your financials while you're trying to figure out how to get a good latch. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Where's the focus? All right, so let's talk physical. Um, Mm -hmm. And I feel like having done the wrong thing, I can answer this one pretty well. (laughs) Not exercising too early. I think we, a lot of people, and I've had people like 10 days postpartum show up for postnatal. And I feel like, didn't I just see you last week in prenatal? And I lovingly send them away because I think we have to honor the massive change the body went through and give it some time to heal. So I think exercising too early can be pretty detrimental. The pelvic floor may not be ready. There may be abdominal diastasis. So giving your body some time to heal, at least let me for the bleeding to stop. And if it was a surgical birth, it really should wait the full six weeks before exercising again. You know, that doesn't mean you can't get outside and take a walk. That doesn't mean, you know, you can't enjoy the sunshine. You shouldn't be isolated in your house. That's certainly not going to help. But don't jump on the treadmill or cycling bike or stair mouse or whatever, or even yoga practice too soon. We want to make sure the body is really honored and supported when it is time. Because if you actually start too early and the pelvic floor doesn't have support, you can actually create some pelvic floor, some pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and if someone has diastasis where the two, the rectus abdominals, um, the integrity between the two muscles has been lost, it can worsen that. Uh, and then also working with someone that knows what you're doing, what your body's been through. Because you shouldn't just like go back to the gym and do crunches. That's going to make everything worse. Or jump right into plank. That's going to make everything, you know, it can often make things worse. So really being slow and mindful about getting back to the physical. And maybe your physical activity is just working on a few parts of the body that are achy. Maybe it's just putting on an online yoga video that's just working neck and shoulders, you know, with some of the achy spots. I just want to repeat something you said because it's it's worth people hearing it. <laughs> Exercising too early is going to be make your body heal slower. It will make everything harder to recover in general. Yeah. Um, it's not doing you're not doing yourself any favors by exercising too early. And I would just encourage new parents and new moms in particular to honor their bodies and honor how they're feeling and really listen to themselves and their intuition. And if something is painful or not feeling quite right, give yourself the space and time that you need to recover fully. And then keep listening. Don't throw yourself back into something because you have an expectation because your body has changed and it will never be the same. That never. doesn't mean you, you're not going to look good. <laughs> it just means you are a different person. Yeah, you created a person. You could still fit back into your pre-pregnancy genes. Mm-hmm. But as my midwife said, the landscape of your pelvis is forever changed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, It may look Absolutely. the same, but you created – 
a person you created. And then if you're choosing to breastfeed, you're creating substance for that person. Mm-hmm. You know, So a little bit of honoring self-care and self-kindness can really go a long way. And I think that's what's often forgotten. I think some of it comes from insecurity. Some of it comes from just personality type. And some of it comes from neglect of oneself that that postpartum, it's not just about caring for the baby, but it's also about caring for the new parent and the transition from maiden to motherhood and the transition into parent and responsibility. I think self-care and self-kindness is really pushed aside and it's it's sad. I think we need to honor this new life and new journey and new responsibility and new body and new relationships. And unfortunately, as I mean, yeah, I think it's just, we, that's not a focus. For a lot. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, it's almost backwards. It's almost like there's an expectation that people need to get back to looking a certain way, and that is self care. But actually, you're doing more harm physically, um, and you're not listening to yourself, which means you're not caring for yourself. Yeah. You know, it's not to say you can't just, yeah, go back to your old genes, just like you said. It's just give yourself more time and the space to do that in a way that is is right for you, for your body, and right for your family. Because, you know, going and injuring yourself further or getting yourself in some kind of rut because you you think you're failing at looking a certain sort of way, that's going to make you miserable. That's going to make your partner miserable. It's going to make, you know, your your baby, they might not be able to communicate because they're so tiny, but like they feel energy. They, Mm -hmm. they will, they are your children, believe me, and it becomes more obvious as they get older, but they are reflections of you and your energy and, and what you put into the world and, and give, letting them feel the love that you have will teach them to love themselves too. Absolutely. And it's not just showing them that you can't, like the more you care for yourself, it's, it's teaching them to care for themselves. And also coming to the mental side, we think about the number of women that suffer from postpartum depression and then, or, or post, what's it called? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. And we're putting the pressure of you have to look and act a certain way and step into this role of mother. It's, it's staggering when we look at, I believe the reported number is one in five women, but when I worked with someone from the motherhood center, she believes it's actually one in three women will experience mm-hmm. that. So now not only are they someone not physically feeling themselves, they're experiencing this transition, but mentally they may not be in a good place. And then again, we strap this idea of like, okay, you had a baby. Now you need to be Instagram ready. I oh. think it's too hard. Yeah, it's too much. It's, it's, um, it just, it's a disservice to women. Mm-hmm. And I think it, one thing I'd say when preparing for life with a newborn is that the partner and family and friends should know the signs of postpartum depression because they may not necessarily see it. And if the, if they don't know it, they may just say, oh, that's just so-and-so adjusting to parenthood. She's having the baby blues. But I think it's important for people to really understand. I actually remember – One of my close friends, um, our babies are – my second, her first are pretty close. And I really saw this massive anxiety disorder starting to form to the point where I was going to talk to her husband. But she luckily – he actually did first. He kind of noticed it. Because some people, if you're not aware of it, you just – you kind of just brush it aside. Oh, she's just adjusting. Oh, she's a little moody. I Mm -hmm. think, you know, if it's going undiagnosed, it can really affect how someone's enjoying their – fourth trimester, as you mentioned, how the baby, how the relationship, these little people pick up on everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. They're forming their relationship with the outside world and you are their guide on how to do that. If your energy is uptight and anxious and it affects the way that you handle them or, or just inter, um, communicate with others around when you're around them, um, they're going to, pick up on that and potentially make that their pattern as well Mm -hmm. at a fairly, a very early age. They will internalize that in ways that are not visible to us. (laughs) So, so yeah, I I mean, creating this space to have a more positive experience and be loving towards oneself is not to be underestimated in any way, shape or form. And I also think admitting that it can be hard. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be incredible highs mixed with some really incredible lows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And we, I th- we have some episodes um, on our podcast as well, t- touching on topics of like signs to look for. Um, and it's not, it's not always obvious either. I mean, you can't just ask someone, you can't ask someone, Hey, are you depressed? 
Um, no. That doesn't really work. <laughs> no, because they might also be offended. So <laughs> Yeah. And then they also may not realize it. Um, if so, I have some of the signs, if you want, I can ramble off a few. It's feeling restless or moody, feeling sad and hopeless, crying a lot, having no energy or motivation, which can also be fatigue, um, eating too little or too much, sleeping too little, too much, having trouble focusing or making decisions, memory problems, kind of feeling worthless and guilty and losing interest or pleasure in activities they used to or withdrawing from friends and family. And then one that I've heard a lot of my students come up with is that they have headaches and aches and pains and stomach problems that won't go away. When I hear a student talk about, you know, she's just not feeling herself and she's been having constant headaches, I usually try to do an extra check-in with her. And then I, I often, we have a resource list at the studio that if someone's really feeling that they're, ha- they're struggling, I want them to have this list in case they need to make a call or just get extra help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. PSI, Warm Line, it's in English and Spanish. Um, it's a free resource. There's someone who could just talk to you. That's and great. answer questions and maybe you, you know, maybe you will fall into the category of needing extra support or not. It doesn't hurt to check. Like that's mm-hmm. one of those things that just falls into the category of like, it if does you're not hurt. sure, you might as well just check. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that what the, the thing you said about just not feeling yourself, like that's something that's come up before in the past of like, just if you have this feeling like I'm just, it's not really me. And it, it's different from okay, I'm a mom now. So of course that's a new persona and new identity. It's like that other thing of like, who, of like just you're not feeling like the typical person you were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, th- and I think, as you said, it doesn't hurt to check. And it's really important that friends and family can clearly see this person and know what to look for. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So we've covered off a lot of the practical topics. Thank you so much. That, I feel like you just summarized like so, <laughs> like 20 uh, d- different topics on our show. <laughs> And wrapped it all into one. So it was really fantastic. (laughs) There's so many things there. Um, So we talked about some practical information, caring for oneself and others and preparing for life with a newborn. What what else would you want to um, cover? I think it's going to remind people again about the highs and lows that, you know, I remember there was, there's a time when my son was three weeks old and he had done his first nap. And we had a great morning and I remember taking him out. It was the summer and we went for a beautiful walk. And in New York City, we ha- I was right near um, the river and I went down around the river and it was wonderful. And then we came home and then he missed his next two naps. So what turned out to be a day of very wonderful highs and like that moment of like, oh, I love this life into him crying hysterically and everything I did did not work for him. I bounced him. I swaddled him. I wore him. Like I couldn't wear him too much because it was too hard on my pelvic floor, but like I really, I was holding him and, and, and shushing him and nothing worked. And I just sat on my birth ball with him and I started to cry too, (laughs) which I think many moms can relate to. And I, I actually used a mantra that I use with a lot of my birthing women as well as my own birth that this too shall pass. And I I had to talk myself out of my own hysteria that this too shall pass and that this low moment that I didn't know what to do and I felt like, what am I doing as a mother? This was a big mistake. I am j- where I thought I had it all put together like a few hours before that. <laughs> Fast forward three or four hours and I was a wreck. I just had to remind myself that this really low moment would pass. And so I remember I called my husband and I'm like, when are you going to be home? And he showed up an hour later and he just took the baby and said, you rest. And that was hugely helpful. But it's being okay with being a wreck because that will happen. And then something will swing better and you'll have another good moment. And then you'll feel like you'll feel reaffirmed that, yeah, I'm, I'm a good parent. And then something else will happen. <laughs> so I think it's being okay with the roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm that comment. I'm a good parent. We take it so personally, don't we? Like if, if, if our child is unhappy oh. or if something, if there's a regression and yesterday, yesterday they could do something really handily and today they can't or something changes. I mean, it's just, it seems so personal, but it isn't, is it? Yeah. And it's really hard. At least I find that I find it really hard to separate and let my kids be their own 
person, people without me feeling, I mean, we, they're a reflection in our values and our, you know, our core beliefs, but at the same time, they're themselves and their failures and successes aren't a reflection of me. And, and I think that's really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. I think there's, um, we just spoke with someone recently on the show about, um, speech development and language and communication. And, um, definitely there's this idea of that's out there of like, you know, pushing your kids and, you know, you know, preschools having these hardcore curriculums and things is because people think it's a reflection of them and their parenting skills. If their kids can sort of achieve certain milestones at a faster rate than other kids in comparisons. And it's like, it's like that same trap. Like we compare ourselves to other moms, we compare ourselves to other parents and, um, And then we compare each other's kids. I mean, all of it's so totally unfair. (laughs) Yeah. To the kids, to ourselves, to our friends that we're secretly competing with. So I I really try to separate their achievements. I'm proud of them, but I didn't achieve it. They they achieved it or or they didn't or they failed and they're going to learn from what didn't work. So it's it's hard, but it's something I really strive for. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ups and downs are very real. And it's often, you know, like things that are, I found in the past, like hard for, hard for our children or hard for us. It's like, are you, have you slept enough? Are you hungry? That's for my son. Have you eaten? Because when he gets wackadoo, I'm like, you need to sit and eat to just put something in your mouth. (laughs) Yeah. Are you getting enough love and attention in this moment? Do I just need to look at you for a minute? You know, it's, it's not too dissimilar from kids and adults when you boil it down. Yeah. So you work with women who have just had their baby in a yoga studio environment. Is that right? Yeah. So it's called the prenatal yoga center. So the majority – well, it's pretty 50-50 actually. The majority of our classes are prenatal yoga. And then we have all these childbirth education and infant massage and infant CPR and all you know, all the prep. And then we have like the new mom support group and the breastfeeding support. So the whole center and what's turned into my whole life <laughs> has come is, <laughs> is around um, supporting pregnant people and new parents uh, through this interesting eye-opening journey. And, you know, everyone's own experience has really been enriching to watch. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and and everyone's experience is different. Absolutely. Even the same parent as I've experienced, you know, the same parent will have two different experiences with births and two different children or three or four, whatever they choose to have or one. Um, so yeah, just being okay with what starts to happen. I think just kind of letting go of the reins a little bit. But yeah, so my whole, my whole focus as a career is with the expectant and new parent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've seen so many different experiences and you've been able to share so much knowledge and experience with us today. So thank you so much for that. Do you have any kind of final thoughts you want to leave us with? I think I can. I just keep going back to it's okay to just ride the roller coaster mm-hmm. and just self-care, kindness. You're mm-hmm. not doing yourself any favor constantly striving for something that's unrealistic or constantly comparing yourself to someone else. On that note, we will wrap up. Thank you so much. Listeners, you can go to our website, which is fourthtrimesterpodcast.com and read more about this conversation that we had with Deb. So Deb, thank you so much again for being on our program. It was really fun. Thank you. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town without any fear You got your pedals, you got your brakes You always wear your helmet for safety's sake Oh, okay.
again Bicycle man I know you're doing all that you can I wrote the song Simple and true I wrote the song I sing a song for you Hello again Bicycle man I know you're doing The best that you can I wrote the song Simple and true I wrote the song I sing a song for you